For as the light of the morning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, and covereth the whole earth, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Therefore sanctify yourselves, that your minds become single to God, and the days will come that you shall see him. For he will unveil his face unto you, and it shall be in his own time, and in his own way, and according to his own will. This is Unveiling Jesus Christ. Hi, welcome to another podcast on Unveiling Jesus Christ. I'm John Castanet. Today we're going to be talking about Revelation chapter 3, verses 17 and 18 which correspond to section 35 in my book, if you're following along in the uh, nutshell version of what we'll be talking about today. Now, last time we talked about the lukewarm Laodiceans who were described as being a people that were neither spiritually cold nor hot, and Christ warned them that he was going to vomit them out of his mouth because they were neither cold nor hot and essentially lukewarm. This week, he has even more criticisms and harsh adjectives to describe this people. So when, as we begin Revelation 3.17, it's going to talk first about why this spiritual apathy existed in the Laodicean church. And this was a city and a people who were distinguished for their riches, and they considered themselves to have no need for religion. So they had this sort of feeling of independence from God and this self-sufficiency. And we can liken them to uh, one of the types of seeds or soils um, in the parable of the four soils. The Laodiceans would be likened to the seeds that fell among thorns that are described in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, which says, quote, He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful, close quote. So the point of that verse is specifically this concept of the deceitfulness of riches. And this is what the Laodicean saints had basically succumbed to was the deceit of their rich conditions that left them believing that they really didn't have need for God or to be serious in their faith in Jesus Christ. So after we go through uh, verse 17, we're then going to talk about uh, um, verse 18 that begins to tell the lukewarm Laodiceans how they can solve this problem of their spiritual apathy. So let's begin with uh, Revelations 3.17, which says, quote, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, close quote. <laughs> I kind of warned you, some pretty harsh adjectives for a people who uh, were lukewarm in their uh, faith and spiritually apathetic. And their problem, as you can see, is, uh, they, is rooted in their temporal riches. They are increased with goods and have need of nothing. And so Laodicea was a city that was a prosperous banking center and very proud of its wealth. And uh, to give some indication of just how wealthy this city was, there was a, a pretty significant and severe earthquake in about 60 AD, and much of the city was destroyed. And uh, the city was essentially rebuilt on the money that was had within the city itself, meaning the citizens themselves were able to uh, rebuild the city and they refused Roman disaster aid. That's kind of like, um, you know, some of these wildfire disasters and things like that out in California, flooding, earthquakes, uh, you know, hurricanes down in the south and in the east, and uh, you have all of these uh, significant things. And of course, we always call in FEMA, the uh, Federal Emergency Aid uh, people, and they come in and, and bring their resources, and the federal government brings its money to the table. Well, in the uh, the case of the Laodiceans, when they had that big earthquake, they told the federal government, which was the Roman Empire, no thanks, we don't need your help. So they were very, very wealthy, and uh, their temporal needs were so satisfied that they really didn't take any thought for their spiritual needs. And this is this is all too, too true. We see it in the world we live in today. And many of you have been on missions and uh, have had missionary experiences. Where do you find your most success? Is it you going to these wealthy areas? And the, 
The answer is obviously no. Um, and you, you find that the people are more humble in these uh, poor areas where they don't have a lot of wealth. And uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, on uh, my Facebook page, uh, which is also called Unveiling Jesus Christ, um, you know, I, have, I probably have now about 50,000 followers on my Facebook page. And it's interesting because I will get comments back that uh, um, one of them in the last little bit was specifically a comment about how my topic or my substance on my website ap appealed to these poor and uneducated people. So it's kind of a derogatory comment. Um, but he, it's like I'm, I'm hearing from one of the Laodicean saints who says, uh, you're just doing this. The poor, uneducated people are the only ones who believe in Christ. And uh, um, there's a lot of truth in that. And it's not because it isn't true. It's because only the poor and uneducated don't have this pride that prevents them from opening their heart, which we'll be talking about in the next podcast when we get this uh, discussion in uh, Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. But at any rate, the, the, the wealth has brought into the life of Laodiceans and many people today this pride that brings about the uh, complacency and self-satisfaction. And the Savior basically is telling them, you don't have a clue because he says in, in verse 17 when he says, and knowest not. In other words, you're clueless. Uh, they have this perceived spiritual well-being and uh, the problem is that uh, it's a lot connected to and associated with this uh, hypocrites that uh, the Savior often talk about who don't consider themselves to be hypocrites. So someone that has a lot of pride, uh, they take pride in themselves that they're not prideful. <laughs> <laughs> and yet they're very hypocritical. So Professor J.F. Mosley, who was a British historian and an Anglican priest, he studied at Exeter College in Oxford back in the 1700s, and he had this to say, quote, Who is to convert the hypocrite? He does not know he is a hypocrite. He cannot, upon the very basis of his character, he must think himself sincere. And the more he is in the shackles of his own character, in other words, the greater hypocrite he is, the more sincere he must think himself, close quote. And so uh, that's, that's really the problem with these uh, Laodiceans is their self-satisfaction has led them into this sort of self-deception. And so uh, the Laodiceans kind of gloried in the appearance of spirituality as if they didn't need any more. I've got plenty and I've got some to spare too. Um, and they had no need of the spiritual gifts or grace. And so they, they looked upon their temporal wealth as though they have these spiritual rich, riches when in fact their condition of their miserable state is something that should have produced an actual distress with them, and yet they were spiritually numb. Uh, and it, it kind of reminds me, my, my daughter Jamie is a CRNA, and she, another word for that is nurse anesthetist, but I can never say that word. <laughs> <laughs> so I just have to say CRNA. But anyway, you know, so we've got the, the hookup if we ever need something to uh, numb us, right? So, uh, but so far she hasn't helped us out, but uh, has given us some pretty interesting story. But the, the issue is she uh, gives some type of drug that uh, creates this anesthesia that people don't feel things during operations. And you know, the problem with a lot of people is they go through life spiritually anesthetized and uh, they don't even recognize it. Uh, I think a little bit about uh, the movie, Remember the Titans. And uh, you'll remember that uh, Coach Boone comes in to uh, play for uh, this high school team and uh, he's a black coach and uh, it was a time of racial segregation in the south where they were trying to uh, integrate them but actually in virginia not so far south but uh, at any rate so they bring him in and they they have coach yost who was the was the head coach and lost his job so that coach boone the black coach could come in and take the head coach job basically is a symbolic gesture but at any rate, they have a lot of conflicts that uh, they go through. And one of the things that happens as they're getting ready to go to the training camp is Coach Yost 
tells the new coach Boone that he thinks his offensive playbook is a little thin and he has some ideas he would like to share with him. And Coach Boone responds that uh, his plays are just like Novocaine. <laughs> They work every time, you know, and, and that's true. And so uh, you, you think of having uh, the dentist work on your mouth, giving a couple of shots of this Novocaine and it numbs you up. And, and this was the numbness of the Laodiceans, right? Uh, and the problem is, and you, maybe you've had this experience that after you've had Novocaine shot into your mouth and your mouth is all numb, you don't recognize what you're biting and you bite down on your cheek. And I had that recently. I took a big old hunk out of it. And uh, at any rate, you, you have this uh, self-harm that you're inflicting upon yourself because you have this numbness drug that's uh, operating on you. And spiritually, that's what's going on in the life of those who are spiritually numb. It's what was going on in the life of the Laodiceans as they were causing this spiritual self-harm to themselves. And they didn't even know it. They bit their own cheek and I don't even know it. <laughs> Until the Novocaine, of course, wears off. And then all of a sudden they say, oh, what have I done? Um, and hopefully it's not too late for them to uh, rectify the problem. And uh, President Kimball talked about this uh, spiritual numbness as a condition of many people in the world today when he said, quote, there are even many members of the church who are lax and careless and who continually procrastinate. They live the gospel casually, but not devoutly. They have complied with some requirements, but are not valiant. They do no major crime, but merely fail to do the things required. Things like paying tithing, living the word of wisdom, having family prayers, fasting, attending meetings, serving, close quote. So all of these things are the things that uh, when we lack them in our lives, we become spiritually numb. Uh, we have this feeling like the Laodiceans that we're spiritually self-sufficient. Everything is fine. All is well in Zion kind of attitude. And that's the problem that was faced back then. And it's a, not a new problem. Um, we still have it with us today. So then the Lord goes on to describe in uh, verse 17 that the Laodiceans are wretched and miserable. So he's, of course, talking here about being spiritually wretched and miserable. Now, some translations of the uh, New Testament and in the book of Revelation in particular use the definite article to describe these words as you are the wretched and you are the miserable. And so it adds to the point and force of the Lord's judgment against the Laodiceans because thou art wretched, essentially like saying they are the most wretched. And so uh, the, the wretched and the miserable conditions that they are described as existing in is this uh, concentration of this kind of extreme horror. You have to try and imagine someone who is just in this wretched condition. You've seen pictures of, uh, of famine, of war, of homelessness, uh, the Holocaust prisoners, uh, and just the, the wretched looking images that uh, come to mind. This is what the Savior is using to describe the uh, Laodiceans. And so it's like uh, when you're watching a news program and they're gonna show you some clip of some war scene or uh, who knows what, but you know, they always come on and say, they, they warn you before they actually show you saying, some of the scenes that you're about to see are disturbing. <laughs> and that's essentially what we should receive before we start into verse 17. And we're being told that these are the wretched Laodiceans and the miserable Laodiceans. We should have had a warning come up that tells them, this is about what you're about to see here. And uh, so that's the, the problem that they were facing and it's essentially the kind of this image of a slave that has been worn down to nothingness by bitter bondage and so they are wretched in the sense that they're worn out and they're fatigued with these grievous labors as a prisoner and miserable or in a pitiable state that inspires our pity and our compassion for them and so the words evidence and amplify the reason for their rejection because they were just lukewarm in the gospel and were neither hot nor cold. And so Christ is basically telling them that he is about to reject them for their tepid state. 
He also, in verse 17, describes them as poor and blind and naked. And all of these, of course, are spiritual maladies. Uh, they are rich materially, but poor spiritually. So, uh, as I mentioned, this is a very prosperous city um, where they had all their temporal things uh, taken care of. And among their uh, uh, activities in commerce, in addition to being a banking center, they were also uh, had clothing factories and were famous for their uh, their black wool that was produced in this area and the clothes that were created. Um, and Christ is emphasizing, of course, that you might be rich, but you're actually poor. And you might be uh, well clothed, uh, because of your factories, but you're also blind. And we're also going to get into the spiritual blindness because this area was also famous for an eye salve uh, that was produced in the uh, the area. And uh, so you you might have an eye salve that uh, can make and help people with their physical blindness, but you're spiritually blind. So he uses all of these conditions of this city now to describe them in these three ways. And so if you take a look in uh, these conditions, uh, they are also described uh, in today's terms in Doctrine and Covenants section 6, verse 7, which says, quote, Seek not for riches, but for wisdom. And behold, the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto you, and then shall you be made rich. Behold, he that hath eternal life is rich. Close quote. And this is what was lacking among the Laodiceans, just as it's lacking today by those who seek after temporal riches instead of spiritual riches. Now, Paul had this to say in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. He said, quote, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Close quote. So again, we get the, the concept of uh, being spiritually rich is uh, far favorable to being temporally rich because temporal riches are not going to get you eternal life. Let's talk now a little bit about this concept of uh, spiritual blindness and uh, you know when I think of spiritual blindness I have to think of my own life a little bit uh, with the concept of being temporally blind because I've I've had my share of problems with uh, with my eye and I remember back in 1978 it was I think I had already gotten my mission call and was getting ready to go into what was then called the LTM in April of 1978 and a couple of weeks uh, no more than a month before I was getting ready to go into the LTM. I was uh, working my construction job and uh, we were doing some demo along this roadway where it had these heavy iron pipes that were used as kind of a barrier along the roadway and we were taking them out and they'd been embedded in concrete and so we pulled them up and they're of course concrete attached to uh, the metal pipes and so we had to get that off because we wanted to take the metal down to the the metal works place and you, you had to get all the concrete off so i'm sitting there with this sledgehammer hitting on the pipe you know to, to cause these vibrations to break loose the concrete and uh, hitting on the concrete and uh, you know i've described how back in those days things were a lot different because i didn't have any safety glasses on or anything i just think back on that i think well how stupid was that <laughs> At any rate, so I'm, I was in there pounding on this uh, big chunk of concrete flew up and hit me in my left eye and, and caused me to be totally blind in that eye. My eye had some vessels that were burst and the inside of my eye filled up with blood and they put me in the hospital for a couple of days to see if the, the blood was going to uh, be absorbed back into the eye. And after several days, you know, I started to be able to see things kind of blurry and eventually did get my sight back. But ultimately caused some cataracts and I've had five surgeries on my eyes two of which were uh, uh, cataracts and uh, so the Laodiceans their their problems their, with their eyes of faith they had spiritual cataracts kind of like I had physical cataracts that uh, prevented the uh, the light from getting back into the uh, light because the cataract what it does with the lens it kind of 
creates a little bit of a cloud over it, so uh, you don't you don't see as well and, and doesn't allow as much light. And then I had to compound that with what's known as the Fuchs disease, which uh, essentially it's a weird kind of thing where you've got this little layer of cells beneath your cornea um, that serve to kind of keep uh, water from filling into the cornea so that uh, you can see clearly. And when they don't work properly, the uh, behind the cornea, um, can fill up with fluid and that fluid then causes like these little blisters and so if you think of a blister how it fills with some kind of fluid um, that's what was going on in both my eyes with this Fuchs disease and it's very painful it's, uh, <clears throat> when you have these uh, uh, the, the fluid filling up um, and acting like it uh, creates these little bubbles that then can kind of pop and it's like rubbing sandpaper over the uh, cornea of your eyes and so in order to solve this problem, I've had three operations on my uh, corneas to uh, replace with donor tissue that little layer of cells that are like these water sucking machines <laughs> that take the water off of the, the lens so you don't get these blisters forming on the, uh, the front side of your cornea. I had to have three of them. I don't have three eyes, but I had to have three of them because one of them didn't take. So at any rate, uh, you know, it, during the operation process, uh, uh, they part of the process that they use blinds you for several days. So I, I know all about the, the concept of being temporally blind. And I, so I'm going through these things kind of, you know, I'm thinking about this concept of, oh, wow, this is what it likes to be uh, spiritually blind for those people who have... Uh, these ailments that uh, they don't treat properly and uh, do the things that they need to do to cure their uh, spiritual problems in their lives and their spiritual sickness. So at any rate, I've got great empathy and understanding for this concept of being spiritually blind, which the Savior describes in John chapter 9, verses 40 through 41, where he was talking about the, uh, the blindness, spiritual blindness of the Pharisees and others. And he said this, quote, And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. Close quote. And it's kind of interesting because, of course, the Pharisees are claiming that they see when, in fact, they really don't. Um, but Christ telling them, well, if you truly see and you act like you're acting, then you are sinful and your sin remains. Um, but for the Laodiceans, of course, their spiritual blindness led them into a condition in which they couldn't even recognize their poor spiritual state. And they couldn't see within themselves. And so, uh, as I mentioned, the, this uh, city and the analogy that Christ is using is uh, very compatible because this they had a, a famous medical school and they had this Phrygian stone that was ground up to make something called calrium. And uh, it would be mixed with this kind of little bit of an oil to make this eye salve. And uh, the... Uh, the problem was is even though they had the ability to do something to assist the eyes temporally, um, they didn't have anything to assist themselves with their spiritual blindness because their pride left them unable to see and recognize their pathetic condition. Okay, let's talk a little bit about their spiritual nakedness, which uh, the Savior also talked about in his derision of the Laodicean saints. And so again, they're spiritually naked and in a spiritually destitute conditions. Uh, it's equivalent to saying that they had no religion because often in the scriptures we have uh, the saints um, who are righteous and they are clothed with white garments and in white raiment. Um, and these saints were left naked, meaning they had no righteousness, they had no religion. Um, the Sardian saints had an opposite condition. Now the Sardians were, of course, a group that the Savior had praised without condemnation, whereas the Laodiceans are condemned without commendation. So in Revelation 3-4, in describing the Sardian saints, the Savior said, quote, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy." 
close quote. So we get the opposite extreme between these two particular cities as it relates to uh, their condition in clothing. And as I mentioned before, Laodicea was famous for its black wool and it's uh, the manufacturer of woolen garments. And so this is a, an appropriate symbol that the Savior uses as the master teacher who uses the circumstances of his audience to explain something to them. So it will have more meaning to them than just uh, the ordinary individual person such as us who wouldn't appreciate that unless we know that about them. Okay, let's go on to uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 18, where the Savior says, quote, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see, close quote. Now, it's kind of interesting here where this verse starts out saying, I counsel thee. Um, it, and so he's counseling these merchandising saints to do business with him in order to be truly rich. And this counsel is, it's a little bit of, a, of an irony, really. It's, it's like saying, you know, why don't you take my advice? <laughs> I mean, he could be commanding them, saying, I command you to do this. And yet he's really talking to them as a people who would be immune to any kind of command from him in their current spiritual condition. And so he says, listen, you guys are business people. So let me give you a little bit of advice as one who knows about merchandising and what's really valuable. And so he uses words that are understandable to this kind of materialistic uh, people, both in their hearts and in their minds. And we've, I, I view this as kind of this another level of condescension of Christ, of God coming down to the mortal level. And he really has lowered himself to their level saying, listen, let me give you some advice. And so he talks to them in terms that are familiar to them, something that will have meaning to them. And this is all about this concept of using the circumstances in their city as clothing manufacturers, as a wealthy city, as a city that produces medicine for the eyes, all of these familiar images that he uses by coming down to their level so that they can understand in the best possible way. And unfortunately, probably many of them still ignore him, but at least he, he lowers himself to their level rather than staying up in his position as a God saying, this is what I'm commanding you to do. And he does it with us too. He talks to us in things and in ways that will we understand all the time. Okay, so one of the things that he's counseling them to do in verse 18, of course, is to buy of me gold tried in the fire. And so uh, we recognize, of course, that uh, we procure things that we want by way of purchase or buying them. And it's true whether we're talking in temporal terms or whether we're talking about spiritual things. We don't get spiritual objects or procure spiritual things without some effort, that we have to put something into the bargain, into the deal. And so uh, these spiritual blessings are procured, but we're told essentially that you can actually get things of the Spirit without price. And so this we see in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1, which says, quote, Ho, <laughs> everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price, close quote. <clears throat> so what we learn in this verse and what the Savior is explaining to the Laodicean saints is that you can buy things of great spiritual worth and it's not going to cost you any money. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that it doesn't come without any price whatsoever, but it's not going to cost you temporal money in order to obtain things that truly are of great value. And the thing that is of great value is what Christ is describing here as gold that has been tried in the fire, meaning it's it's refined gold. It's not like you're going and chipping out of rock, uh, you know, it's like the man from Snowy River, the, uh, the old guy that has his gold mine up in the hills and chipping away trying to find the mother load and <laughs> he's just not getting good color till near the end of the movie and finally he sees it. But that's unrefined gold. That's just like you still have to refine it. And 
and put the fire to it so that you get this refined gold. And that's what uh, this verb is referring to where it says gold tried in the fire. It means it's, it's burned, it's to be on fire. And it's in the perfect passive tense that it's used in this particular sentence, which means it's an ongoing process. It's not like it's saying it was tried and now it's over and done with, or it will be tried in the future. This is current, uh, the perfect passive tense. And so it's making this idea that it's an ongoing and continuous process of burning and kindling that will be made to glow and melted with fire in the refining process. Now, um, the uh, speaking of the saints who um, are themselves then to be tried and refined in the fire of affliction, Zechariah wrote to those, particularly in the time frame of the second coming, when he said, quote, and I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people and they shall say, the Lord is my God, close quote. So as we kind of look at these and understand that when the Savior is talking to the Laodiceans about gold being tried in the fire, the image is, that we have this pure gold, but the saints themselves are the gold. They are the ones that he wants to refine and take them from their condition of spiritual apathy to one of being zealous in the cause of Christ. They are the gold that he's trying to refine, and uh, that comes without price of money, but it requires some action on their part. We see a similar saying as that which is found in Zechariah in the book of Malachi, similarly speaking of the second coming, where he said, quote, But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and pur purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Close quote. That, of course, comes from uh, Malachi chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. And uh, I love these uh, particular verses here in the book of Malachi, and uh, I love teaching them to uh, my seminary students many years ago. And uh, let me share with you the uh, how to talk a little bit about these uh, verses and how they can come to have meaning in the lives of young people, old people, anyone who's kind of uh, struggling and needs to be part of this uh, refining process. And so what I would do is you've got this uh, concept that we need to refine this silver that's full of impurities and stuff like that. And so what I would do is I'd take a, uh, a large flat skillet into the seminary class and I'd put a mirror down in the bottom of the skillet. So we're talking about a skillet, you know, that's a couple inches high um, and kind of like a frying pan, I guess you'd say. And so uh, you'd put a mirror, a flat mirror down in the bottom of it and then I'd take a bunch of wheat and I'd pour wheat in on top of the mirror so that you couldn't see it. And so then I'd have the seminary students all gather around and we pretend that we're going to refine some silver. <laughs> so, so what you do is you, you, you kind of gather them all around and of course it's important that you have a chair that the teacher sits at looking over the skillet and I have a spoon so you can start spooning out the wheat off of the top of the mirror and you kind of stir it around, stir it around and as you stir, you kind of scrape down and start getting close to where the mirror is and you, you look at it, oh, we're getting close to having pure silver because the dross is all risen to the top and as we scoop it off, this wheat being scooped off, you start to see the little slivers of this mirror shining through and eventually they, they begin to see, oh yeah, there's a mirror at the bottom. <laughs> And uh, and so <clears throat> eventually you get all the, the wheat removed off of the, the mirror. And now here's the, the point of the lesson that you can kind of talk about as you go through it is how, you know, you have to have the heat. And one of the issues is it talks about the Lord sitting as a refiner. And, and, and I kind of beg the question, I said, how? Why is he sitting down? This is uh, this is a delicate process, you know. We have a, we're applying heat to this uh, refining process. He's sitting down on the job. Why is he sitting down? <laughs> and the discussion, of course, is is be precisely because it is an important process. He sits there, 
and he's very attentive to it. And he kind of sitting over and he kind of looking down on the uh, the skillet as you removing the dross and he's very attentive. It's not like he's off, you know, running around pay, being unattentive. And so that's why he's sitting is because you have to watch close because silver can actually scorch just like milk. If you overheat it, um, it, it can burn and you can ruin the silver. And so you have to keep stirring and keep moving it around and being very careful, not getting too much heat, but enough heat so that the refining process is completed. And what's interesting about the analogy and having this mirror in the bottom of the pan is once you remove all of the wheat, which is your dross, and it's removed from the, uh, the skillet, when you look down, I would ask the students, uh, someone come over, take, take a look at this silver, look down, what do you see? And they say, well, I see myself. <laughs> And, uh, and that's exactly right. And that's the way that it is with the Savior because we are the silver. And when the refining process is completed, when he looks down at us, what he should see is a reflection or his own image. And, uh, and that's what the re uh, refining process is all about. And that's why I love these uh, verses. It's just such a, a, a great, uh, when you understand the process that is going on and how you can use this skillet, a little wheat in a mirror to, uh, to emphasize it, uh, it's a really powerful lesson. And uh, that's what the saints in Laodicea needed. They needed to be refined. And the Savior was willing to do it, but you had to be willing to allow him to uh, bring the fire of refinement into their lives, uh, which he was, was going to do and did do but probably not with much effect. Um, so <clears throat> these spiritually uh, poor and naked uh, saints could buy gold from the Savior without price, but you, you know, they, unless they put in some effort into it, um, you have to recognize that you're never going to be able to go through the refinement process. So some think that uh, you can get spiritual things without any price, um, but the reality of it is the atonement pays the price um, for the refining process, but in return for that, the expectation is there will be repentance and there will be obedience to the commandments. So, Second uh, Nephi 2.4 tells us that salvation is free, and that's true. It means it's freely available, but it is purchased through repentance and obedience. Our third article of faith says, We believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. So you have that connection there of the atonement making salvation free, but purchased by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. And so <clears throat> gold, the, the gold offered by Christ is still affordable even for the poor and destitute Laodiceans and they can purchase white raiment from Jesus Christ which are representations of righteousness and the garments of his salvation and it will cover their moral nakedness and shames uh, but the price of that clothing is through their good works and uh, that in contrast to their famous black wool garments that were produced in the city. Now these spiritually uh, blind Laodiceans uh, were, were basically blinded by their pride of intellectualism, their wealth, uh, and the enlightenment of which they boasted. They were self-deceived like the Pharisees um, and Christ ridiculed them for their spiritual blindness as we've already seen. And so this constant symptom of being lukewarm is an absolute unconsciousness of it. They couldn't see their own nakedness. Um, and the, as a result, the blessings of exaltation were forfeited. This is kind of reflected in Ephesians 1.18 that speaks of having eyes of understanding that you may know what is the hope of your calling and what the riches of glory are for those to inherit. Um, Melvin J. Ballard, an apostle in the church, said this, quote, May God bless us to keep our eye upon our glorious destiny and recognize that within our hands are the means of accomplishing such an end and not be blinded to our privileges, close quote. Okay, let's uh, talk a little bit about, uh, in verse uh, 17, this uh, concept about how the Laodicean saints were supposed to anoint their eyes with eye salve 
that thou mayest see us. So the eye salve is uh, the only place where this word occurs in the New Testament is in this verse. It is a diminutive word derived from the word cholera or a coarse bread or a cake. So being a diminutive uh, word collect, uh, associated with that, it means it's like a small cake or a cracknel. Um, and you kind of got to compare it a little bit to the idea of the Savior when he healed a man by using his spit to make clay as a type of eye salve for the uh, person that he was healing. And uh, you have the idea that this verse is telling them you need to have your eyes anointed. And so uh, this word anoint is from the infinitive to anoint instead of the imperative verb, which like, is like a command that you are commanded to anoint. And so uh, essentially this is an invitation from the Messiah to anoint your eyes coming from one who is the anointed one. And so you kind of get the, uh, the connection between them. And who else but the anointed one would have the salve to anoint the eyes that are spiritually blind. And so this imagery, as I've mentioned, has particular meaning to the Laodiceans because uh, they created this uh, Phrygian eye salve, uh, which wasn't really an anointment per se, it was probably some type of powder, uh, maybe mixed with a little bit of oil um, that was smeared on the eyelids. Um, so not necessarily directly onto the eye. And so, uh, but at any rate, the, the concept is, is that uh, the spiritual eye salve was used so that they would be able to see. And uh, we, we think about this, and of course we're reminded uh, in the New Testament of the experience where Christ healed various people of blindness. And he did it in various ways, sometimes simply by speaking, sometimes by touching, sometimes by going to the extreme of anointing their eyes with clay, and then also telling uh, one, in case one, to go wash and then come back and let's see how you're doing. And uh, the, the clay was, in a sense, like a spiritual crutch until the, the faith of this man was able to take over. And it's a little bit like uh, consecrated oil is used. I, I call it a spiritual crutch. That probably doesn't sound that good of a word. But essentially, for those where faith was lacking a little bit, it is a help to them. So not crutch in a, in a bad way, but something that offers support. Um, to a certain extent, think of the, the Urim and Thummim, which I think was in many senses a spiritual crutch for the prophet Joseph Smith, uh, which he used to translate the Book of Mormon until his own faith and his powers as a prophet, seer, and revelator had developed to the point where he, he basically didn't need them. He's, he's crutch-free. <laughs> and so uh, the first uh, you know revelations that he received in the Doctrine and Covenants were received through the... Uh, uh, the Urim and Thummim, but eventually, as he grew spiritually, um, he, most of the, the revelations didn't come through that means, and he was able to do it without that, uh, that aid or that assist. And so <clears throat> Bruce R. McConkie talks a little bit about this concept of how the Savior used certain things to help those with lesser faith to uh, be healed keeping in mind that the Savior himself wasn't lacking in faith. It's all about the faith of the person receiving the miracle. And so this is what uh, Elder McConkie had to say, quote, Frequently, in opening the eyes of the blind, Jesus, as here, coupled his spoken command with some physical act. On this and other occasions, he touched the sightless eyes. In healing the man in Jerusalem who was blind from birth, he anointed the man's eyes with clay, made with spittle, and then had the man wash in the pool of Siloam. The blind man of Bethsaida was healed by application of saliva to his eyes. Similarly, in healing a deaf man with a speech impediment, Jesus both touched the man's tongue and put his fingers into the man's ears. None of these unusual and dissimilar acts are essential to the exercise of healing power. Healing miracles are performed by the power of faith and in the authority of the priesthood. By doing these physical acts, however, the master's apparent purpose was to strengthen the faith of the blind or deaf person, persons who were denied the ability to gain increased assurance and resultant faith by seeing his countenance or hearing his words. Close quote. 
So that's essentially kind of confirms what I've been talking about uh, a little bit. And so among the Laodicean saints, of course, who were a people that had very little faith and needed a faith-promoting eye salve uh, applied to their eyes um, in the words of the Savior. And so uh, the eye salve would be applied to their eyes, of course, by action on their part. The, the salve won't apply itself. There's something that you have to do. And so today I kind of described some of my... Uh, uh, problems I've had with my own eyes and because I've had some donor tissue put in each of my eyes uh, to assist with the removal of fluids from behind my cornea I take one drop a day of a steroid in each eye to keep the uh, the eye from rejecting this donor tissue in my eye now if I forget one day to uh, to use the steroid drop does it mean I'm gonna go blind no uh, but if I repeatedly forget about putting the steroid drop in my eye, then eventually my eye could reject the donor tissue. And so it's a little bit like praying. Um, every day uh, we're supposed to pray. Now, if you miss one day, do you become a Laodicean? No, I, I don't think so. At least I hope not. Um, but if you miss praying every day, then yeah, you're going to degrade your spiritual condition to the point that you will become like a Laodicean. So applying this eye salve, uh, begins with something as simple as one little prayer if you're not praying right now uh, and uh, you get better. And Brigham Young said, well, what if you do? He was asked, what do you do if you don't feel like praying? And his answer was, well, you pray until you feel like it, <laughs> which is a, a pretty simple answer. It's all, not always that easy, but yeah, that's, that's, that is the answer. It is what it is. And so all of these things about uh, doing things that will cause you not to be spiritually naked, not to be spiritually destitute, not to be spiritually blind. All these are an invitation um, to bring Christ back into our lives if he's not there already. And he says in Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, 63, says, quote, draw near unto me and I will draw near unto you. Seek me diligently and ye shall find me. Ask and ye shall receive. Knock and it shall be opened unto you, close quote. So all of these things are, he's waiting. I mean, he kind of comes so far, but he's not going to come all the way. <laughs> you know, I, I think of the movie Hitch, if you've seen that, uh, the guy where he's this kind of uh, uh, a romance whisperer, if you will, and he sets up conditions for uh, uh, guys who are trying to uh, find and, uh, and win the heart of the girl of their dreams, and he's uh, helping uh, the, uh, the guy in the movie um, to learn how, to, how he's supposed to kiss a girl. <laughs> So he's sitting there on the doorstep practicing with him, and he says, okay, now uh, you got to go 90% um, and then let her come the other 10%, right? And so uh, that's the, the lesson to be learned here, too, too in a funny kind of way. Um, the, the Savior will come to us, but he's not going to come all the way. He, he requires us to come part way. To meet him and so we have to seek him diligently realistically we need to go the 90 percent you know put in the extra effort and and uh, this is what is also reflected in what we're going to be talking about in our next podcast in revelation 320 where the savior says again speaking to the laodiceans quote behold i stand at the door and knock if any man hear my voice and open the door i will come into him and will sup with him and he with me Close quote. So there he is. He's at the door. He's knocking. But you've got to come to the door and actually open it. And that happens through everyday acts of obedience to the gospel. It's, uh, it's like training at the, uh, the gym, which uh, I've gotten better at doing in my recent past. And, uh, you know, when I hadn't been to the gym for a long period of time and I was getting a little bit overweight... <laughs> So I start going, you know, those first few days, I mean, they're murder, right? Let's face it, you, you know, uh, I started uh, running and, you know, a couple laps around the, the gym and it's like, <gasps> I thought I was going to die. And now, you know, I run a couple of laps and it's like, okay, I got some more in the tank and away we go. And so uh, you can start slow and, uh, but you have to work your way up and, and get yourself to coming back into uh, the good graces of Jesus Christ and uh, having some zeal 
in your life, which he describes. So essentially, if you're, uh, if you're feeling a little bit less than uh, spiritual, uh, a little less than you'd like to be, it's not a lesson for those who are completely lukewarm. It's a lesson for those that uh, could be better than we are. And it's time to start working out spiritually and, you know, push yourself a little bit more each day. And one of the machines that they have at the gym is the uh, the stair climbers, right? So you got these stairs that just keep appearing out of nowhere and they keep going down and you got to keep walking up them in order to stay on the same place and not get yourself thrown off the machine because you're not keeping up. And I, I don't use those. I don't really care for them that much. I do biking and, and jogging and stuff like that. I just, the stair climbers never appeal to me. But the point is, is that these stair climbers are like the escalator of life that we're on. We're all on this escalator trying to get to heaven, but the stairs that we have to climb to get there are really like an escalator, and they're not sitting there stationary. They're actually coming down, and so you have to put in more effort to go up the escalator that's coming down. And the fact of the matter is, if you're only staying stationary in your spiritual lives when you're on the escalator of life, guess what? You're actually going down. <laughs> And you may not even recognize it. And that's the problem of the Laodicean saints is they were on the escalator of life that uh, they have to be putting in energy to get up the escalator. And because they were just sitting there somewhat stagnant uh, and not doing anything in their lives, they were actually going backwards. And this is the reason the Savior is so harsh in his condemnation of them is they don't even recognize that they're actually getting worse because they're not doing anything in their spiritual lives. And that's why he was going to spew them out like vomit because there was nothing else he could do with them. That's, what, that's the consequences of their own choices or their lack of choice to put in the energy to do better in their life. So that's a lesson for all of us. All of us are on that same escalator and uh, hopefully we're putting in enough energy to be moving our lives forward. And uh, I hope that's the case for all of us. And uh, I thank you for listening, watching, subscribing, and sharing. Thanks for Jennifer, all the help. And tomorrow we're going to be talking about uh, Revelation uh, 3, verses 19 and 20. That's the verse I read a moment ago where Christ is standing at the door, uh, knocking, just waiting for us to uh, open it. And so uh, I'll, I'll be with you tomorrow. Thanks.